virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics. Thank you everyone for joining us today and for showing your continuous support and overwhelming response towards this event. We look forward to your interactive participant throughout this workshop. Today we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Manus Kumar Fokon, um, head and the principal scientist of Geosciences and Technology Division, CSINIST, um, as a uh, guest or an honorable chairperson. Uh, yesterday we have witnessed a very enlightening lecture delivered by honorable director of BGRL, um, Dr. Sukant Roy, on deep drilling and downhole measurements monitoring to understand earthquake processes. Today we have with us Dr. Margarita Sego from British Geological Survey as a keynote speaker, and she will be delivering a talk on the topic The Physics of Earthquake Interactions Recent Advances Informed by Deep Learning Catalogs. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Manus Kumar Fukon to provide his initial remark. Over to Dr. Manus Kumar Fukon, sir. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir, you are audible. So a very good afternoon to one and all. So uh, we are very privileged to have uh, Dr. Margarita Segu, British Geological Survey. So uh, we have a very interesting series of lectures during these days, and I hope that today's lecture, the physics of earthquake interaction, recent advances informed by deep drilling catalogs will be even more exciting. We look forward uh, to this session. And with this, I wish uh, all the best uh, to Dr. Margarita Segu. And also, uh, we are grateful to you for accepting our inv humble invitation for, to deliver a talk in this uh, seminar. So thank you. And Ohado uh, Molia to, to continue the proceeding. Thank you, sir. Before moving ahead, now, may I request Dr. Timang Susetia to read out an illuminating biodata of Dr. Margarita Segu. Over to Dr. Setia. Yeah. Namaste, am I audible? Yes, you are. Audible. Yes, you are. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, namaste. A very warm good evening to everyone from the land of Blue Hills. Uh, it's my privilege, and I take this opportunity to read out the brief biodata of Dr. Margareta Sigo today. Dr. Margareta Sigo is a senior researcher, scientist at the British Geological Survey in the Lyle Centre, Edinburgh. Dr. Margarita holds a BSc and MSc degree in geology and a doctorate degree in geophysics from the University of Athens. She currently leads the development of physics-based mathematical forecast models using continuum as well as statistical mechanics for different settings of natural and induced seismicity around the world. The major research interest of Dr. Margarita currently is focused on the improvement of aftershocks forecast model in seismic active regions of the world, such as Greece, California, and New Zealand. Understanding of static and dynamic earthquake triggering mechanism forecast models based on real-time seismological data, seismic risk reduction and hazard mitigation, real-time evaluation of earthquake probabilities. She has published more than 50 papers in reputed journals, conferences, and seminars. She has also received the prestigious Henry Poincare Award for her postdoctoral studies in Nice, France, for the development of physics-based forecast in high seismicity, high-risk settings. Since 2015, she conducts research at the British Geological Survey in Edinburgh, UK, and collaborates closely as honorary fellow with the University of Edinburgh. She is an editor of the Oxford Press Journals for Earth Sciences, Geophysical Journal International, and a broad board member of the European Mediterranean Seismological Center and the Communication Committee of the Seismological Society of America. She has served as panel member and external reviewer for scientific proposal evaluation in US, UK, and EU funding bodies. She is also a broad member of the Communication Committee of the Seismological Society of America. Last but not the least, this is a very brief of her research and knowledge endeavor. Thank you, Dr. Margarita and over to Navajuti. Thank you so much, Dr. Setia. 
Now, may I request the keynote speaker of our today's session, Dr. Margarita Sego, to kindly take over the digital forum and enlighten us with your lecture. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much about your invitation and for your uh, very complete uh, introduction. Uh, sorry for the problems uh, that we had uh, experienced earlier today, but now we are ready to start. Um, so if you are uh, sharing the screen, I am ready to, to start with the presentation. Great. So the talk today, it would be about the physics of earthquake interactions. And as this subject uh, is informed by deep learning catalogs and enhanced catalogs that they are very recently published. Uh, next slide, please. So some um, key aspects of the talk today will cover um, the key factors in making a successful um, rate and state forecast uh, based on physics. And this has been um, recently um, uh, described in uh, the publications you see in the parentheses. Uh, we will talk about stress interactions, stress changes, and how we describe the stress field in the Earth's crust using different notions. For example, total stress versus optimal faults. And we will be discussing also experimental testing strategies, which is a very uh, interesting issue. And later on, towards the end of the presentation, we will see two examples of the application of forecast models in um, high resolution uh, hydraulic fracturing uh, data sets. Next slide, please. So a lot of the results you're going to see today, they are um, coming out of a project which was jointly funded by the UK NERC and the US NSF GEO uh, under the title of the Central Apennines under a new microscope. So this large scale project um, actually included three sub projects and they have started um, in 2016. And the, the focus of the project was um, about detecting, locating, and characterizing seismicity in the central Apennines during the 2016-2017 earthquake sequence. Understanding the evolution of this sequence, so what are the triggering mechanisms and the failure mechanisms, and uh, develop and validate forecast models using physics and statistics. So on your left side of the slide, you are seeing uh, how the sequence started on the 24th of August of 2016 with um, one large event near the village called Amatrice, uh, followed by a 5.4 um, aftershock half an hour later. Uh, next, please. It continued towards uh, the next two months, towards the, the, the um, uh, green epicenters on the north um, prolongation of the Amatrich Fault uh, near the villages of Viso, uh, with two events above five occurring on the same day on the 26th of October. And then after four days, next slide please, we had uh, the largest uh, magnitude uh, quake of the sequence, the 6.5 Norcha event, to the northern again of the uh, um, part of the sequence, which was followed later. Next slide, please. By the burst of activity in January 2017 at the south now of the sequence, you see the, uh, those epicenters in yellow um, near the village called Campotosto, which is very well known because it actually has um, the on top of this seismicity, uh, we have the second largest dam um, in Europe. So it was a very important issue how we monitor the sequence. Together with a group of people that you see on the screen, uh, involving US, UK, and Italian partners, we deployed together more and more seismic instruments as days passed. And approximately, to give you an idea, 
this um, almost 60 kilometer rupture uh, area was covered by more than 90 stations during the first year of the sequence. If you please go to the next slide. So during the project, we developed different catalogs. So if we go from left to right, you will see um, what we call CAT0, which is it represents the monitoring room catalog, which uh, was becoming available in real time from the statutory um, geophysical institute in Italy, the INGV. And as we move towards the right, we see the results of a catalog development through the years of the project. So we have the development of CAT3 using um, automatic pickers and the permanent only uh, stations, uh, seismic stations during the sequence, which gave way to CAT4 on um, the third column, which represents now permanent and uh, temporary deployment, deployed stations for the duration of the sequence and automatic pickers. Um, and then on D, you see CAT5, uh, which is the result of deep learning detection techniques uh, published as FaceNet from Zuen Barroso 2019. To give you a rough idea of what you are uh, seeing here, uh, CAT4 had uh, around uh, 300,000 events, whereas CAT5 had around 1 million events. Uh, so now if you uh, go to the next slide, please. So now, I would like to give you, you know, a, a brief description through this figure of TAN et al. 2021 about the differences between the best standard catalog and the deep learning catalog. So the deep learning catalog here on the cross sections on the right um, gives us uh, some more information um, when compared with the black dots, which are representing the standard catalogs. So we see, for example, in, um, in cross-section uh, marked as D, that the deep learning catalog reveals some uh, silo seismicity from zero to five kilometers depth. Uh, and also as you move in cross-sections um, further below, you see that the um, power of the deep learning catalog actually reveals very well the, um, uh, the near horizontal surface ramp uh, around um, 10 kilometers depth which is something we observe through the central Apennines. So if you go to the next slide, please. So now if we see the difference between standard catalogs uh, of real-time monitoring and the deep learning catalog in B, uh, this is a very nice graphical representation uh, from uh, Barroso Seguin Musavi 2021 Perspectives in Nature Communication. Uh, which gives us an idea of how uh, standard versus deep learning catalogs compare. With the star, of course, you see uh, the largest uh, quake today. And all the earthquakes uh, you see in both uh, in the, this figure are representing quakes above the magnitude of completeness. So imagine now that you have a 2.5 completeness on the uh, left side from the real-time monitoring, which has reached um, 0 0.5 completeness with the deep learning catalogs. So we are actually being able to track with high, very high resolution uh, the evolution of seismicity through the deep learning applications available to us at this moment. Next slide, please. And here I will begin talking about the, the actual experimental strategy we followed through the project to understand the triggering mechanisms and develop aftershock forecasts. So as we move here from left to right, we are progressing in years through the project. And this experimental forecast protocol we see here is the, described by the following. So as you see on the left, the basic CRS-1 model, which is based, CRS stands for Coulomb rate and state. So it is based on continuum mechanics principle and uses um, the quakes to propagate static stresses and static stresses to 
um, describe the evolution of seismicity is the most basic one. And CRS-1 was uh, developed in phase one of the project. So, and we have three phases, as you see. In the first phase of the project, we are using for the development of the forecast model and the validation of the forecast model, uh, the network catalog, meaning the real-time catalog that I just showed you as the left side um, figure of the previous slide. Then on the second phase of the project, we are using the same catalog, the real-time catalog for the model development, and we're using enhanced catalogs to validate the model. And we are doing this to ask ourselves if um, the forecast model using real-time data could actually be informative of the evolution of the sequence, even in the light of uh, new data, more enhanced coming in. And the third phase of the project actually reaches the, uh, the, the borders, the limits, if you like, of our predictability, meaning that now we are using for the development and the validation of the forecast model, the enhanced catalogs. So as you see from left to right, the, the, the picture that you see and the warm colors representing high aftershock expected rates are becoming more and more enclosed by the, the dots that correspond the, to the observed seismicity. And of course, it, uh, the models also escalate in complexity. And we will talk about why this complexity is needed and how we represent this complexity in forecast models. Next slide, please. So here is how we actually develop the experimental protocol. So we start by having a brief statement of what this is about. So the experimental protocol starts with the Madrid earthquake on the 24th of August. It is done in pseudo-prospective mode, meaning that uh, we are predicting everyday seismicity without actually using the next day seismicity as input. So this is what we mean by out of sample. The, uh, the forecast horizon is one year, so we are tracking the development of the sequence for an entire year. Uh, the forecast models are daily updated, and of course they are evaluated each day for one year. And they restart not only within um, the, the one day, but also when a significant event happens. Uh, so the primary question that we are trying here to answer is whether stress-based models like CRS are uh, equal or not poorer, at least, in predictive skills um, than statistical ETAS models. So our outcomes are determined by using predefined statistical metrics for model performance, as described by the Collaboratory for the Study of Earthquake Predictability. And our design principle is the introduction of a single element in each of the seven uh, CRS models towards increasing complexity with the aim to quantify which elements improve the predictive power of stress-based forecasts. So if you look now at the table, you will see, for example, that some um, elements are underlined and these are the different elements we each time add each time we add to a forecast model. So, for example, if you um, compare between CRS2 and CRS3, you will see that seismic parameters such as the source model um, or um, the depth the magnitude of major earthquakes um, are um, taken from preliminary catalogs versus CRS3, where we are considering revised catalogs. Um, so, and this idea goes through, of course, the next and the next CRS model until we reach CRS 7, uh, which is the most complex model and uses revised solutions for seismic parameters, uses a minimum triggering magnitude of three for secondary triggering effects. So we take as sources all events above magnitude three. We are considering um, slip distributions uh, from co-seismic um, models that they are more complex, um, a 0.4 friction, 
We are spatially varying the receiver fault models uh, marked here as SVP. And we will be talking on how we are actually doing that in our next slides. And we are optimizing model parameters uh, through uh, log likelihood optimization. So this is briefly what we have been doing in phase one. And of course, all those models um, with um, the, 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 best, the best selected CRS7 model is passed then to phase two and phase three where um, we just described how we develop and evaluate um, the models using enhanced catalogs. If we go to the next slide, please. So here is the differences in map view of how a very simple versus the most complex model looks like. So here you see on the upper part of the figure, the, the simplest um, model, CRS1, uh, for different time periods between, on the left, the four days between Viso and Norcia events, and on the right, the full one year of the sequence. And on the lower um, panel, you see the most complex expression, CRS7, for the same time windows. So as you see, for example, very vividly, the expected number of events now, they are crossing over from blue colors to orange and red colors, marking that every time we are adding complexity, the description of seismicity follows closer the, the, the space of the aftershock sequence. And if you now look um, the CRS7 for one year, and you, you um, compare it with ETAS, which is the statistical benchmark model, which represents the gold um, standard for earthquake forecasting in operational uh, terms now, uh, you will see that there are differences. For example, the CRS7 for one year has um, predicted a stress reduction where uh, stress shadows are expected to the southwest of the sequence, whereas ETAS here seems to have a more isotropic uh, kernel with enhanced um, with heightened aftershock rates everywhere around the sequence and not just uh, very close to the rupture area. Uh, next slide, please. So we had to actually quantify uh, in a meaningful way the advantages and disadvantages of each um, model. And uh, the figure you see here is the quantification of the model comparison. Uh, so what we do here, we are using log likelihood metrics as defined by the CSEPT uh, collaboratory. And we are uh, evaluating models in phase one and phase three, as you see in the left and the right uh, hand side, respectively, of this slide. So the um, benchmark model here is the simplest CRS model. So we are comparing CRS3 against the simplest uh, CRS model, CRS4 and CRS7. So where colors turn to uh, darker green, uh, this means that we have um, an advantage, we have an improvement over the benchmark model. Uh, and you see going from CRS3 to CRS7, then um, the observation uh, the, the, the element, the model element that makes um, the performance better of the model is the introduction of spatially varying receiver planes. So this seems to be very important. So the question that came to mind is how we are, how we are going to construct and develop over time the notion of spatially varying receiver planes. So in phase one, we have done that by using focal mechanisms of past seismicity before 2016. And the question that popped in our mind is, do we actually need focal mechanisms during the sequence to improve even better um, our results? And at that time, um, people in, uh, involved in the project um, haven't finished their work on focal mechanisms. But um, for our scientific knowledge, um, the best choice at that moment to test our hypothesis, uh, next slide please, was the Ridgecrest 2019 sequence. 
So the Ridgecrest 7.1 um, earthquake um, in Cal happened in California on the 9th of July, on the 4th, sorry, of July of 2019. And as we all know, California does represent a high quality um, uh, catalogs with uh, L uh, seismic attributes that cover not only location and magnitude, but also focal mechanisms. So we tried to test the idea how much better physics-based models would be if we would use uh, focal mechanisms of aftershocks as the sequence evolves to even better our models. So if you now take a look on the left, we are just replicating the same uh, experimental protocol for consistency over the Ridgecrest sequence. So the top level here represents the most basic CRS-1 model. And you see that on the north side, on the, on the north part of the rupture zone, there is some seismicity, which seems to have an offset from uh, the orange colors. It goes mostly towards the bluish um, colors with low expected rates. Uh, and this is consistent, uh, even if we look at the 24 hours from the 6.4 Surly uh, Valley pre-main shock, or the 24 hours after Ridgecrest, or even one month after the beginning of the sequence. But in the middle panel, as you see, when we are using focal mechanisms with the most complex and advanced CRS model, we are tracking very efficiently if you uh, see F, particularly uh, the evolution of the sequence. And on the lower um, uh, panel, you see how ETA's model statistical forecast look, look like. Of course, um, we are also tracking with ETA's uh, uh, very nicely the evolution of the sequence, but we do not observe the, the, the lowering of expected rates where the shadows uh, appear. So if you now take a look on the left side, sorry, on the right side of the slide, you will see the results of uh, information gain, uh, meaning how much better our forecasts are when compared with uh, the most basic CRS-1 model. On the, on the x-axis, you see all the models that we have developed, and you will see on the middle and right panel for 24 hours after the Ridgecrest main shock and for one month after uh, the most complex CRS-7 is actually tracking seismicity uh, three times better and around two and a half times better um, than uh, the basic CRS. And keep in mind that this is logarithmic, so every time you see an information gain of three, it means that the model CRS-7 is 1,000 times 10 to the 3 times better than the basic CRS-1. And the second thing you see in this figure is that it, it is actually performing better in B and almost equal within uh, a variability um, with ETA's model. So these are the results that we got from applying the forecast experimental protocol in Ridgecrest. So now if you go to the next slide, We were trying to see why here, why we're doing better if we use focal mechanisms from the unfolding sequence. So here we had two models. We had the most complex model parameterization using only past mechanisms, past focal mechanisms provided before 2019, and the same parameterization using focal mechanisms during the sequence to, to predict the evolution of the sequence itself. And we were, we were, we are seeing, um, as you see, some uh, green colors uh, on the map view, meaning that there were some zones here, one, two, and three. So there were three zones with um, uh, green colors, meaning that our new model using small magnitude events from the unfolding sequence was actually doing better than the model using focal mechanisms pre-2019. And we try to understand why this is happening. And the tripartite the diagrams on the right uh, actually explain this very uh, graphically. Because you see, for example, that uh, in B, in the upper panel, uh, that we got on, on the top of the triangle, uh, 
um, an increase around 15% of strike slip mechanisms. Um, of the during the sequence versus the mechanisms that we were getting in pre-2019. And if you look at C, we are seeing on the top of the triangle, for example, again, uh, an increase in zone two of the strike slip focal mechanisms. And we actually see near garlic fault a slight decrease of strike slip mechanisms. So it seems to us that um, the slip vectors of the aftershock uh, mechanisms are indeed uh, different uh, than the collocated focal mechanisms in pre-2019 period. And from that, we do understand that fault planes update, uh, updates, they boost our predictability because triggered rupture populations at very localized scales do vary over time, but they do remain an important descriptor uh, of the um, uh, rupture during the sequences. So artificial intelligence catalog development now provides uh, these new seismic attributes, for example, focal mechanisms in the particular test, and this actually makes physics-based forecasting um, a very unique testing approach for evaluating each new seismic attribute found in those catalogs. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Of course. But um, since we are talking about, you know, physics-based models, we do have to acknowledge that, um, you know, the stakes are high and, of course, um, static, static stress changes and rate and state um, um, models do represent simply part of the reality uh, of the Earth during um, uh, seismicity sequences. We definitely need to add more physics in physics-based models. And here I present some um, uh, very interesting study about the tomographic differences during the sequence as this becomes enlightened by the very rich, um, uh, the enhanced catalogs we had from the sequence. Uh, so this is described all in Caraba et al. 2020 in uh, Geology Journal. And um, uh, they have started, we have started to track uh, VPVS ratios through the sequence. And we have started from uh, September 13th, um, to the day of um, VESO, uh, seismicity, where the double fives occurred, which culminated on October 30th, as we said, to the 6.5, the largest uh, event of the sequence. So if you see now uh, on the left panel, uh, on the right uh, hand side, uh, the VPVS ratio near the hypocenter of Norcha, which is marked by the yellow star, has gone through some changes and um, it has um, actually reduced uh, significantly on the time period 26 to the 30. So four days before the 6.5 event occurs. And if we want to take a more comprehensive look of how VP uh, has moved, uh, you see on the lower right hand corner uh, this variability um, uh, as tracked at the hypocenter of Norcha, and you can see how VP has increased, uh, has actually 30 days after uh, the 26th of August has reached the stability and has started um, steadily the four days before a uh, Norcha event to decrease. And we do need to understand, of course, better how this uh, medium responses here described by the VPVS ratio have actually exerted uh, influence over the preparation uh, processes on the Norcia hypocenter. Uh, but in order to do that, we need a more systematic documentation of those changes. We need to track also statistical significance over longer time frames, over decadal scales. Uh, and that exactly will be essential for the future physics-based earthquake forecasting and stress interactions. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
So here, for example, is the very last stage of our development. And you see many map views of the area with plenty of forecast models. This is the phase three and experimental testing phase. And the target here of research is having these five catalogs of the sequence to create five versions behind each uh, physics-based implementation in order to evaluate the relative contribution of standard, meaning real-time, enhanced with standard techniques and deep learning catalogs in advancing our predictability. So as you see, let's say on the imaginary x-axis of this figure, we are developing the models using CAT0, CAT3, CAT4, and CAT5, which is the deep learning catalog. And on the x-axis of this figure, you are seeing that every model is evaluated through all these catalogs. And the, the, the colors do represent the number of expected events in every cell. And the, um, the black dots represent the observed seismicity as described by CAT0, CAT3, CAT4, CAT5. So let's now see in uh, quantifiable details the differences between these um, forecast models. Next slide, please. So here is um, exactly the, the results in information gain um, with benchmark model, the simplest, the most basic physics-based model using the real-time catalog. Uh, and if, you, if we now focus on the left-hand side marked as CRS, we are seeing an evaluation of the CRS models. Uh, on the left-hand side, developed with CAT0, the real-time one, and developed with CAT3, the one of the first improved uh, catalogs. And let's focus on the development with CAT4 and CAT5 on the lower left-hand uh, side of the figure. And you see blue colors and you see red colors. So the blue colors correspond to the model developed with CAT4 and validated with the deep learning catalog. And the red color represent the model developed with CAT4 and also validated using CAT4. So the first thing we keenly observe in all these figures is that every time we are going to lower triggering thresholds, as described in the x-axis, you see in the x-axis M1, M2, M3 to M5, meaning the minimum triggering um, magnitude is M1, M2 or M3, uh, which represents the lower magnitude for which we incorporate events as seismic sources in our experiment to propagate stresses. So the first thing you see is that as we go towards lower triggering magnitudes, the improvement, uh, each model, um, no matter what catalog was used, it improves. Uh, it continuously improves. So we go from the right to the left within each subfigure towards higher information gain. But I would ask you, I would ask you to, uh, to mark whether this information gain seems to be uh, important. It seems uh, that in the best case scenario for the left hand side, the models do reach an information gain of zero, which means um, it is barely uh, one time better. So it is better, but not greatly than other models, than the benchmark model. And we are not sure at this moment if this is something uh, we see which is due to the forecast model development or, the, or it is actually due to the statistical test we use for the evaluation. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the same evaluations as explained for CRS, but now for ETAS. So we are tracking how much better an ETAS forecast is using deep learning uh, catalogs versus the simple ETAS model using the preliminary real-time catalog. There is a consistent improvement um, going to lower triggering thresholds, as you see in both uh, red and blue colors. And when we are using um, the deep learning uh, catalog or the enhanced uh, catalog in red, 
we are seeing improvements that uh, reach 10 to the 0 0.2. It still is an improvement, but uh, we are thinking for reasons that I will explain later that perhaps a different log livelihood approach is actually required in order to evaluate um, uh, non-Poissonian uh, seismicity rates in such uh, small distances. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So we are doing here an extra test to see if it is an actual problem of the log likelihood uh, metric that we're using. And we, what you observe here is um, for the same uh, models, we are always using here CRS and ETAS um, of uh, the enhanced catalog four, which is the most enhanced uh, catalog using still standard techniques uh, under different binning. So uh, uh, under different spatial binning. And um, I will not go in a lot of details for the sake of um, time economy here, but you will see that as we are actually regreading the physics-based model, uh, the log likelihood is improving. It actually means that the absolute cumulative joint likelihood value becomes smaller. And this means that there are very trivial choices sometimes uh, for example, the study region extend, uh, how Poissonian the catalog is, or here the special grading that we choose for um, developing our model, it actually influences the evaluation. And this is something that we need to um, uh, be very, very much considerate about. Uh, in the initial phases of performance evaluation before 10 years, we used to do um, more extended uh, spatial domains, uh, end time domains going over, for example, statewide for five years. And perhaps seismicity was Poissonian enough, uh, so the log likelihood uh, estimations uh, were appropriate. But here we are tracking seismicity evolution for a 60 kilometer rupture during an aftershock period uh, with a lot of events happening. and maybe the nature there of the seismicity requires actually different line of question to be asked. Uh, next slide, please. Um, can I ask here how much time do I have, please? No, you can go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. So uh, we, have, we have discussed so far um, what we actually try to learn from forecast model development. And this greatly assumes that, uh, you know, we are absolutely right about how we implement static search changes. And the great state framework um, does apply everywhere. Um, but the, the largest question here is, you know, is it a matter of concept how we still apply static search changes? Do we actually fail sometimes because of implementation issues or, you know, we simply do not understand nature enough to capture all this in a physics based model. So here you see the most standard representation in this figure of static stress changes um, motivated by the uh, 7.2 2010 El Mayor Cucapa uh, sequence in the California Mexico borders. And you see the epicenter on the right as a bright yellow uh, large star of the 7.2. And you will you also see, you know, the white, red and blue areas where in blue areas we do not expect seismicity according to static stress changes. But of course, we do observe in reality some seismicity in the blue regions. Um, and you see also um, in um, in the beach balls going from left to right, the the largest the focal mechanisms of the largest aftershock, the 5.7 Cotillo, and with gray uh, you see five more beach balls with different friction, um, representing uh, in our modeling how the classical idea of um, optimal oriented faults for failure would be resulting in the aftershock plane, predicting the aftershock plane of the 5.7 Oco T. So ideally you would expect that um, some of the beach balls would be 
similar within uncertainties or with the black uh, beach ball, which was the observed. But as you see, this not actually happens. So we are trying to see in this research paper what actually, uh, as a matter of concept, we are doing wrong around the implementation of static stress changes. So if you go to the next slide, please. The next slide, please. Yes, ma'am, I already have changed because okay. some network, so I guess it is taking time. Just a moment. Okay, so we have... Is it okay? Should I go on? Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah, okay. So we have uh, here described a different, a new technique on uh, tracking aftershock evolution in uh, time and space. And here you see the, the results of the implementation of this uh, framework. So instead of using one plane to deterministically um, represent the possible aftershock plane using optimal faults as the, the predictor, we are using all planes. Uh, so we are using instead of one, 12,000 planes at each location covering all possible strike, dips, and rakes, predicting aftershocks in every location in strike, slip, normal, or reverse mode, and representing this um, solution space using two-dimensional histograms, as you can see one of these um, on, the, on the right, um, in, as a right inset to the figure in the upper panel. So, and in, in, if you take a closer look around minus 180 and left from zero in the x-axis, which represents rake, you will see marked with red uh, the solution space that corresponds to the focal mechanism of the aftershock. So instead of having solutions only within the red, this method allows to track all possible solutions for, at a specific location for an aftershock. Uh, but, you know, having everything as a solution, of course, it's not a scientific method because, you know, if you eventually you're not learning a lot, you are just accounting for many. Um, so instead of doing that, we have searched the solution space. We have constrained the solution space that you see on the upper panel using focal mechanisms as rupture planes as possible rupture planes from pre-2010 seismicity in uh, the region. And here you see that at 89% um, out of the first three years of the sequence, we did get right within uncertainty, the aftershock rupture planes. Um, and you, you see here marked as blue, the aftershock rupture planes that uh, we hit success. So this, if we just put as a constraint at every location, the nearest prior focal mechanism, we do have success in, in the prediction of rupture planes, which is an important parameter when we're doing physics-based forecasting. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So, but eventually to actually learn what actually motivates, what triggers more earthquakes, we have used the, we have used the, um, the, thank you, of course, for the adjustment. We have used the same solution space under different questions. So here on the upper panel, you see the model results from asking the question, uh, what if, um, the aftershock plane corresponds to the plane where maximum stresses are occurring. And by maximum stresses here, I do not only mean co-seismic stress changes, but also, but here total stress, meaning the addition of the ambient stress field and the co-seismic stress tensor. So if we ask the question, if aftershocks occur on the maximum stress, this seems to be right only at 18%, so actually very low, uh, which actually makes begs the question why this is happening, 
but it is not completely unseen uh, because we know through publications from um, uh, the 2000 and after that the Earth's crust is always in a critical state and even small stress changes can uh, bring faults on the cusp of failure. Therefore, we do not actually, the Earth uh, or the, uh, each fault plane doesn't care if it has reached maximum stresses, but actually requires every time a small amount of stresses during cosmic sequence to, to uh, trigger more aftershocks. Um, if we ask the question, how can we improve what is the maximum predictability of maximum stress, we are using on the lower um, panel an heterogeneous back, background stress uh, as represented by stress um, SH max maps of California available through SCAC, the Southern California Earthquake Center website. And where, when we implement such a heterogeneous background stress, we can only improve by almost 9% um, the use the model uh, when we are using maximum total stress as a predictor. So we are still pretty low when compared with the 89% we are getting from just simply constraining the solution space using past focal mechanisms. Next slide, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry for the delay, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, I already have changed, but it is taking time to reflect. Okay. Here we see uh, tracking model success uh, through the first three years uh, following the 7.2 main. So, so as you see on the uh, figure on the right, you see the success ratio from zero to one for OOP optimally oriented planes, which is the most usual expression for um, uh, receiver planes in stress change um, estimates. Uh, the success ratio of using the maximum stress on the plane and the successful the success ratio of using prior focal mechanisms uh, for deducing aftershock uh, ruptures. So let's now start from looking over time. Uh, the success ratio of OOP. Uh, so we start with around 35% and we have slightly better success ratios uh, after the first year of the sequence. And this is something expected because as slowly uh, this, the sequence and the crust returns to normal, then um, the OOP uh, might be more descriptive of the situation. Uh, we see very low, um, the lowest actual success ratio came coming from uh, asking uh, if the aftershock planes correspond to maximum stress planes. And we see how um, the, the success uh, of the model based on prior ruptures, it is almost uh, always more than 78% through the first uh, three years of the sequence. So this is something that actually tells us the importance behind characterizing as fully as possible um, an earthquake sequence, but also the seismicity history um, of the region we are trying to model. Next slide, please. So, and by coming closer to the end of the presentation, I would like to uh, graphically illustrate to you why we are now talking in 2022 about, you know, forecast modeling and about stress changes in imperfections and problems in implementations. Because, you know, seismology is a relatively new science, but not so much. So we need to understand a little bit for the people and explain a little bit to the scientists among us that they are not actively in forecasting research, why now this is becoming a hot and hot, uh, a very hot topic of research. So in order to illustrate to you why we are very interested about operational forecasting um, the last 10-15 uh, years, I have uh, tried to explain this through um, an, an elimination game, if you like. 
So here I have created some slides uh, starting using the uh, Centennial ISC gem catalog from 1904 to 2020. Uh, from event magnitude 6.5 and a globe and, and above uh, globally. The, the um, events here are color coded by the second invariant of the strain, uh, as is described by Creamer et al. 2014. So when you are going to red and purple, you are hitting the high hazard settings of our globe. And when you are going to bluish and um, greener color, the uh, low hazard uh, countries, uh, locations of the world. So we are starting, let's say, in, with a centennial catalog that has 3000 events. So a lot of 6.5s and above have happened. So why we do not understand better seismicity? Next slide, please. Yes, so if we now, so we see that only 800, uh, around 800 events from the 1904 forward are occurring at land. And these are the events that we could monitor easier, right? Because we have networks and we could actually learn uh, the, the parameters of these main stocks. Uh, so if we click one more, so next slide. So if we ask now the question from the 800 events, which have a rupture characterization, meaning um, uh, do we have at least, you know, moment tensors, historical or not, for these quakes, we are down to 300 events. Next slide, please. So now if we think about uncertainties, at least in main shock parameters, that they are reduced in some subgroup, and meaning we are seeking here uncertainties in main of magnitude uh, plus minus 0 0.5, we are down to 217 events. And we can see here around the time that um, CMT um, have started to appear. And we have started to have a more complete idea about the earthquakes that happen across the globe. So if we now go to the next slide, but in actual, in the operational sense, in order to create and run a forecast development for any country, we want um, information not just for the main stock, right? But we need for small events. So the, the blue line uh, represents um, the notion of how the global magnet of completeness moved through the years. So, and um, if you if you see how the blue line declines, you see that it reaches a magnitude of completeness around three, around 2010. So now we have. I, I just want to remind you that we have started with 3,000 events, and now we are looking at 31 potential candidate uh, sequences for aftershock forecasting research, and from those we should be looking only the ones after 2010. So if we go to the next slide, we actually now have these six sequences to work. And these sequences correspond to names that they are very well known to the community. We see that six sequences, that they are candidate sequences for the type of research that I presented you today is the 6.5 Norcha, for which I the talk was about, the 7.1 Ridgecrest, uh, which I showed you, uh, the El Mayor Kukapa, which you have already seen in the last few slides, the 6.9 Christchurch, the 7 in Kumamoto in Japan, in Kyushu Island, and the 7.8 Kaikura. So eventually we are starting with 3,000 modern quakes and we are down to six potential candidates for after forecasting. And all of those sequences are post-2010, and if you see on the lower uh, side, a bibliographical um, research um, tries to correlate here 
the, uh, the, the increasing publications using Coulomb, Aftersox and OEF with uh, new developments from post-2000 uh, world um, that are directly related with observation seismology. And if you now see, for example, from the world of science, um, in the dust line, the event catalog um, using, using uh, as keywords event and catalog in the world of science gave us 2,000 uh, references. And all those references track this post-1960 evolution of observation seismology. And we see some very, very critical points in our research and in our community um, uh, marked uh, in the early 2000s from uh, uh, improving of localization of earthquakes using HypoDD, uh, the first around 2005 uh, high resolution catalogs uh, coming out from Southern California, and then people working on forecasting uh, in around 2010 um, start to use all these available products for OEF purposes. And then we see, of course, in, in the red dust line, um, what the search from World of Science gave us when we were using Coulomb and Aftershocks. So as you see, the forecasting publications, they are a little bit lagging, but they do follow the increase in observation seismology um, new findings and the new methodologies. And this, I think, illustrates very well why the two communities here to move forward, they need to be very, very close together. And this, th this connection between observation seismology and forecasting research is uh, very well described in Browser Seguin Musavi 2021 perspective article where we are trying to explain why and what we expect in the future uh, to be the advances in um, both fields. Uh, next, please. Uh, I will not take um, the, your time to go in depth in hydraulic fracturing. I want to show you, though, this incredible data set now coming from PNR uh, Preston New Road uh, in UK, tracking seismicity evolution um, uh, under uh, for induced seismicity. And we have tracked this evolution of seismicity using a NETA statistical model, as you will see in the next slide. Here you see briefly that um, an optimized and a standard uh, ETAS model, which has been used in the past for tectonic regions, has indeed success in um, tracking the evolution uh, in different periods, uh, before operations, during operations, and after operations uh, of um, seismicity in, uh, again, the same data set in PNR. Next slide, please. And of course, the same data set now uh, does um, uh, make us uh, think about how we could improve uh, data sets that they are already rich even more using deep learning. Here is the work of um, my student, Cindy Lim Sun Ye. Um, as presented very recently in the UK conference of uh, unconventional hydrocarbons. Uh, we are using all available deep learning uh, detection models and we are um, performing, um, we are evaluating the performance of each model for detecting more earthquakes. Um, and this is ongoing research, but, but it seems that uh, the deep learning uh, face net that I just showed you, you applied in uh, Central Apennines, it is the most successful in um, improving uh, detections and uh, actually finding a very large portion of new events around. Uh, we have an 80% increase of detected events against the best available uh, commercial catalogs. And if you go to the next slide, please. Here, I just want to um, highlight the, the important aspects of what we discussed today. Uh, we have seen a lot of things about CRS models and about forecasting. 
uh, we have seen most importantly that the improving performance of physics-based model using continuum mechanics does increase with increasing number of um, detections, but also with an increasing number of attributes. So we do not only need locations, we need focal mechanisms and perhaps more seismic attributes like stress drops in the future will be critical for operational purposes. And we are almost ready to make this happen. And the second thing that uh, we have seen is that uh, very, very localized background stress conditions can actually influence triggerability of aftershock ruptures in the long term, as we have seen uh, for the 2010 7.2 event in California. Uh, one important finding is that aftershock ruptures do not correspond to maximum stress. But if we use focal mechanisms from past events, we are very we are having in our hands a very successful predictor for expected ruptures. And this is an important guidance. We are receiving important guidance from this on understanding the concepts of triggering. Uh, and newer concepts are already on the way uh, with more dynamic forcing uh, as uh, the principal driving mechanism behind the earthquake ruptures. And the last thing I really want to press uh, today uh, is that this all the things that you have seen today in my presentation are a result of teamwork work over the years with collaborators uh, that even that they're very well known uh, like Tom Parsons in US Geological Survey um, their results that they're coming out of the NSF NERC funded project the Central Apennines and there are also results from PhD and postdoc students, uh, such as Simone Mancini uh, and Mrs. Cindy Lim. And if you want to go through the publications uh, and the results I presented today, everything is uh, with a link on the QR code, which is my ORCID ID on the lower side. And of course, feel free to contact me about any questions that you may have coming out from this presentation. Thank you very much for the attendance and very much for your focus today. Thank you so much, Madam, for such a wonderful and educative lecture. We hope all our participants are highly benefited from your lecture. Before moving ahead, I would like to announce that we will take three queries from the attendees. Although we have enabled the set box for the Q&A session, it appears that it is not working for many of them. Therefore, may I request the participants with a query to kindly raise their hands and accordingly, we may ask you to unmute yourself to clear your query from the speaker. Also, the participant may please send the rest of their unattended questions to the email ID of the convener of this workshop, who will send the questions to the concerned speaker and then will send the response to your respective email IDs. Thank you. So today we are fortunate to have amongst us honorable ahead of the CSI Fort Paradigm Institute, Bangalore, Dr. Sri Devi Z. Madam. Now, may I request Madam to say a few words on this talk? Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So you want me to comment on it? <laughs> yes, Actually, it was a very um, uh, resourceful and insightful talk because, you know, for the first time I could get how machine learning is used for our research. And we are actually, you know, as a fourth paradigm institute, so I could relate to it because we deal with uh, big data science. So I could relate to what she was speaking and uh, I think this is a way because, you know, this kind of work, uh, as far as I know, we haven't uh, made much progress in our country in this. So I think this would be one area where we can focus on. Uh, we would be glad to help any researcher who wants to use um, uh, data science techniques to earthquake research, basically this kind of research, because we have the data science expertise. So... I think um, uh, that would really, I mean, if anyone is interested, we would be able to, from our country, we would be able to help, uh, I mean, give our inputs because we have that kind of expertise. And thanks so much, Margarita. It was a very wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. 
Uh, we are also glad to have our session chairperson, Professor Zaya Kail, former Deputy Director General of Geological Survey of India with us. Now, may I request Professor Kail, sir, to say a few words on this talk. Over to Kail, sir. I think this is, uh, thank you very much, Margarita, for your very wonderful lecture, uh, educating us with the aftershock forecasting research. Uh, I think we have a long way to go to really make a uh, successful prediction, particularly in the field of men's shock prediction, actually. But aftershock uh, forecast, I think, very well illustrated and how focal mechanisms, how seismic tomography and uh, stress failed. They are wonderful to, to be, you know, to be educated today evening by your beautiful lecture. We all appreciate and thank you very much for such a elevating lecture. But uh, do you have uh, any, means how this model could be, you know, extended for Men's shock uh, prediction is is this uh, is there in some I mean some progress towards that uh, for prediction of the men's shock or forecasting men's shock? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this is this is a, you know a great question and this is where science should clearly move now. Um, I, I just want to remind everyone that the relevant terminology of uh, pre-main shock or after shock, it is just ours, right? I mean, the Earth doesn't actually know these things. Um, so what we are, we have to do is create these models to run long term and test them because as the networks are becoming better, the plan is to build uh, catalogs that they are running for 10, 15 years and test the model. We are just testing now in after shock sequence because then the catalogs are very rich because we have many quakes. So it doesn't actually mean that the models are applicable only to aftershock sequences. It is just um, a constraint that we have as a community. And I think um, we should be hoping that um, uh, deep learning that makes uh, very rich and enhanced catalogs available overnight and even in real time uh, now, uh, we actually help uh, finding what happens before the large main So this is this is the focus of active research now, how to extend this. And by extending, we hope that we will be getting closer to your to answering that uh, in the next many years. So, I think that, that's a wonderful gesture, wonderful. Uh, but I may have another query uh, to be clarified mm -hmm. from you. Uh, you all know about the Nepal earthquake, 2015 Nepal earthquake, and yes. the so-called aftershock within a few days, it mm -hmm. was uh, almost equivalent to a main shock. One was 7.8 and 7.3. Mm -hmm. So would the, your model could have been possible to predict that aftershock of, uh, of 7.3, which occurred uh, within 15 days or so in Nepal? Could you please test your model with this Nepal uh, sequence and Nepal uh, data? If it is uh, if it is possible, then I think it would it would really de, uh, you know be a great job uh, for forecasting a very strong aftershock which can be equally damaging. Yes. Yes. So I, I'm very happy that you asked this question uh, because actually um, I would be very happy to share the link with you or you could simply search it. Uh, I have already published the models. Uh, it is published in Seismological Research Letters um, as uh, Seguin oh. Parsons 2016. And we have developed the same set of models uh, tracking the evolution of the Nepal sequence. And indeed, if you use uh, the combination of uh, the pre-main shock stress field and the co-seismic, you see uh, there is a, there is this uh, mountain of height and, of height and probabilities around the 7.2 oh. which means that uh, it was um i don't mean that this was a predicted uh, aftershock but i mean that 
in a in a special complex combination of all the available uh, pre-Nepal seismicity and yes, the stress. Yes. Uh, we had as heightened odds for large magnitude earthquakes in the locations that happened. But of course, you it is. Let's say that in the forecast modeling at this point in time, it is easier to predict location rather than time. But um, if you have the model in your hands, for example, you would move some um, uh, lifelines or uh, response teams out of this region before, or, or at least you would have alternative solutions. So I think uh, I would I would I would say like this: I think we are far from prediction of a single main shock deterministically. But I think these forecast models do give valuable information uh, to, to scientists, of course, uh, that they work in the field um, in times of earthquakes. They do give um, credible information for decision making. And we have seen that, for example, Italy, I remind you, since 2014 has an operation forecasting model, which is a global prototype. So I think what we should be discussing is as we move to finding the, the scientific truth of prediction, which we may, maybe we will never find, we, we don't know, yes. we should be, we should be um, using more and more the forecasting probabilities because it is the same thing that we do with weather, right? Weather gives you an 80% probability of light rain tomorrow. And we, we are listening to weather forecasts in the TV news every day. So I think we should start feeling a little bit more comfortable on using informations like that, uh, depending, of course, on, on the planned usage, uh, instead of waiting you know, for the absolute prediction to be made. Yes. Um, Yes. And, yeah, I, I think that would be my comment on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you have wonderfully explained. And uh, I think uh, uh, you have done a really, you have made a milestone achievement uh, of uh, forecasting the largest aftershock uh, in several cases, as you say. And also for the Nepal, uh, it seems your model also worked very well. Uh, you, could, you could see that a 7.2 aftershock is going to happen. So that is, I think, a great, uh, a great uh, success of your model and of your research. I think you have uh, you have made a very uh, remarkable, you know, um, lecture today, and we are all so much delighted with your lecture. Thank you so much again on behalf of the organizing committee. I again thank you for accepting our humble invitation to Ruby here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Anchor, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, may I request the participants if they have any query to kindly raise your hands and ask your questions. Okay. Okay. Due to time constraint, we would like to request all the attendees who have their queries to kindly email it to us and we will forward it to our constant speaker and madam will send their replies uh, to your respective ability. Okay. Now I would like to request Mr. Pasuizio Bortakur, Junior Research Fellow of CSNS to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Over to Mr. Pasuizio. Thank you, Mr. Navajuti. Namaskar and good afternoon to all. As today's event has come to an end, it is my immense pleasure to convey heartfelt thanks to each and everyone on behalf of entire CSR NIST family and the organizing member of IBWGST 2022. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Margarita Segu for accepting our invitation and delivering such an educative talk. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an uh, edifying lecture. It was a great pleasure to have you as a keynote speaker for this event. Our deep sense of gratitude goes to our honorable director, sir, Dr. G. Narahari Sastriji, for his tremendous support in each and every step of the workshop. Our heartfelt appreciation to the international advisor, Professor Andrew J. Michael, USGS, Professor Dapeng Zhao, Tohoku University, Japan, 
for their thoughtful insight for this live sessions. I further take this opportunity to express my profound gratitude to the session's ASEA person, Professor J. R. Kayal, former Deputy Director General, GSI, Government of India, and session's co chairperson Dr. Vivit Suryanto from UGM, Indonesia, and Dr. Debojit Hazarika, Wadia Institute of Himalayan, Tech Himalayan Geology, for providing needful guidance. I'd also like to thank the special guest of today's session, Dr. C. D. B. Jade, CSIR 4 pi for her kind presence despite of the busy schedule. I'd like to thank Dr. Santonu Barwasa, convener of IBWGST 2022, for his devotion towards this international workshop. We sincerely thank him for providing us this amazing platform to listen and interact with such prominent intellectuals around the globe. A special thanks goes to the members of technical and organizing committee for their hard work and dedication. Last but not the least, I express my deep sense of appreciation to all the attendees for their active participation in today's event. We, the IBWGST team, wish for your continued support throughout this event. We have two lectures for tomorrow. The first lecture is at 10 a.m. from Dr. Sumit Chopra, Director, ISI Gujarat, and the second one is at 3 p.m. by Sri Devi, Dr. C. Devi Jade, CSI 4 p.m. I repeat it. The first lecture will be at four uh, at 10 a.m. from Dr. Sumi Chopra, Director, ISR Gujarat, and the second one is at 3 p.m. by Dr. Sri Devi Jade, CSI 4 p.m. On this note, we are signing from this today's event. Namaskar, Dhanabad. Thank you.